uh, we're going to look at, at rainfall probabilities and irrigation needs. And the other big, I think, caveat that you have to think about in deficit irrigation is about the capacity of my well. And, and so if I've got a high capacity machine out there, I have a lot more flexibility. If I have a low capacity well, that's going to change my timing a great deal out there. So we're going to look a little bit at, at those water demands, so to speak, um, in this system. Um, we're back to that average annual precip is about, goes from about 32 inches down uh, just east of Lincoln um, to about 16 inches out at Scotts Bluff on an average. Uh, this is kind of those ISO lines of, of rainfall amounts, one inch, 25 miles. So what are some of those questions? You know, how does rainfall vary throughout the year? Uh, what are the chances of receiving, let's say, an inch of water in May or any other month? How can we analyze historical rainfall during, and use it in a, in a decision-making process? I've just picked a location at Curtis. We have other sites we've looked at, but we're not going to look at all of those. Uh, you can actually go out to the High Plains Climate Center and download some of these data for your community if you want to. It's uh, pretty easy to find. It's just, if you just type in High Plains Climate Center, um, you'll get the web address for it and you can start to look at, they have some nice products out there to look at your rainfall history. So if we look at, at uh, Curtis, and we're looking at data from 1893 through 2008, if you look at the mean rainfall, let's say in the month of July, they get about three inches in, in the month of July. The wettest month they've ever had was 8.6 inches uh, on 1950. If you look at the driest month they ever had in July, it was uh, 13 hundredths of an inch. Probably all came at once, didn't it? In, in 1935, you know, the, the one day maximum rainfall they've ever had was 3.9 inches, uh, 3.91 inches of, of uh, precipitation. If you look at the annual numbers, um, their mean is 21 inches, their maximum is 38, and they're the lowest they've ever had maybe until this year was 12.6 inches. I'm not sure where you're at in Curtis this year, is anybody here, but I, I doubt it was 12.6. I'm not hearing many people that had that much out there. Uh, if we look at the distribution of that rainfall then on a monthly basis, this is what it looks like. So if we, if we look at, first of all, the, the May through September, kind of the irrigation season totals, uh, North Platte's about 13 and a half, McCook's about 14, Gothenburg's about 14 and a half, and then Holdridge is about, is about 17 inches. I think it's about, what is it, about, um, about 70 miles from Holdridge to McCook? I think that's pretty close. What's our rule of thumb for average annual rainfall? One every 25, we're pretty darn close to that, aren't we here? Okay. Uh, if you look at the, the precipitation then, in Nebraska, especially central and eastern Nebraska, well, all the states, we peak in, in May and June. Uh, June, a lot of places, is our wettest month. Uh, you see in these areas, on average, we're getting somewhere around four inches of precipitation a month. In the month of June, about three and a half uh, in, in um, uh, May. And, and even July, we get a significant amount. Uh, it's a little surprising. Um, a lot of people underestimate the amount that we even get in August, on average which is you know, somewhere around about two and a half inches or two and a quarter inches of rain. These are averages, of course, but you know, we're in an area where our heavy precipitation is going to occur April, May, June, July during the growing season, which you know, that helps us out a lot in terms of being able to reduce our irrigation requirement. Rainfall variability, this is looking, you know, what we all know is that you know, this is the average annual rainfall, uh, I guess this is the rainfall for August at Norfolk uh, over a period of time, and of course it, it's all over the map. Um, and in, almost impossible to, to predict. We can look at uh, these things, though, from a probability perspective. And so, uh, you know, what we do is we rank the data from largest to smallest or smallest to largest and look at how often we might exceed that kind of rainfall. We can ask then what are the chances of getting a, a certain amount of rainfall in, in Norfolk in August. And so this is what that curve would look like for Norfolk in August. Um, so, you know, the average annual rainfall is going to be somewhere around about uh, 2.7 or 8 inches. The probability of getting at least one inch of rainfall, um, you know, probability of a larger is very high. I mean, 90% of the time you're going to expect to get more than an inch of uh, precip in August in, in Norfolk. Just kind of give you a little look at these probabilities. We can also break these down. We went in and looked at weekly rainfall probabilities. and so. Um, you know, these, a lot of our decisions are more driven by a, a weekly kind of thing rather than we are on a monthly number. You know, we express the probability uh, as the chances of receiving a given depth of water of, of precipitation or more during a given amount of time. So when we, if we say that there's a 40% chance, that means 40% chance we'll get an inch of precip or, or more 
in the future. You know, so we'll look at, at some of those maps then across the state. This is a, this is a graph that you can go and download, you know, uh, if you're from my hometown's Benkelman or you can go to Holdridge or whatever, you can download these, these historical maps and look at what, you, um, what your patterns might look like. What you can see here is uh, I looked at a half inch, an inch, and an inch and a half and looked at each month of the year. Uh, you know, there's over a 50% probability of getting a half inch at Curtis. Uh, only about a third, about a 30% chance of getting a, a precipitation. This is now on a seven day weekly period. Uh, only about a 30% chance of getting a, a, a inch of rain in the, in the middle of the summer there. Really low probability of getting an inch and a half in any week. I mean, it happens of course, but you can't count on it with any kind of reliability there. We're down below uh, 20% in those at, at Curtis. So it, it maybe helps you get a little feel for this variability of rainfall. Uh, we went in and did a weekly analysis and um, we got some fun things going here. But anyway, those little exclamation points are locations in the map where we, where we uh, looked at the, the weekly rainfall patterns over a period from 49 through 2004 in this case. And we um, developed a kind of a map of what the probability is of receiving an inch of rain or more uh, in a week at each of those stations. We kind of summarize them on a, on a monthly basis. And then, um, you know, we look at an estimate of likelihood of getting an inch of rain, for example, in that month. You know, our probability is highest in, in May and June. Um, it's about 40% chance in eastern Nebraska of getting an inch in uh, a week, in a week in, month, in May or June. In the western Nebraska, it's only about a 25% chance, one in four chance. Uh, in August, it drops to about 35, and, and now we're down to 10% out west. The western side doesn't get that kind of August monsoon that other places do. Obviously, if we look at smaller amounts, we have a better chance of getting um, uh, that amount of rainfall. And if you look at a two-inch rain, it's really, really uh, low probability uh, of happening. So this is results. Um, I'll just walk through these fairly quickly. This is the probability of receiving an inch of rain or more in a week in May. So we're sitting out here in Dawson County. Uh, there's about a 30% chance of getting a, an inch of rain here in, in Gothenburg in the, in the week of May. Gary out in the Panhandle is down to 24% um, for, the, for that month. Um, if we look at an inch or more in the week of June, uh, it doesn't change all that much here. Dawson County, maybe 35. Scotts Bluff got up to 23%. July is starting to come back down. June's the highest. You know, August now, uh, not such a good chance, Gary, in August, you know. 5% uh, chance in this particular calculation of getting an inch of rain in any one week in, in August. So September is even getting worse. So now then if we say, okay, let's look at maybe what a half inch of rain would look like. Uh, obviously, the percentages are a lot better. Uh, in July, you know, you can get a, about a 43% uh, chance in, in here in Gothenburg and out in the Panhandle, Gary's up to 29. Uh, it goes down in August again, um, September. Now, if we look at the probability of getting two inches of rain, uh, good luck. Um, you know, 13% chance here, um, only 7% out in the panhandle, even during June. You know, this is kind of a summary of those numbers again, um, just to give you kind of a feel of what your precipitation normally looks like. And, and this is what we're talking here that you need to be looking at on an annual basis to manage uh, these systems to look at, you know, well, how much drier is this than, than we, we thought it might be. I don't think it's any use to you to try to predict ahead, but you can see where you're at in terms of normal. Uh, ET, I think we all know what that is. Um, we have our little model that goes through this. Uh, you've seen enough of this. We've, we've used this uh, program then to calculate the uh, growing season ET for corn across the state. And you can see then that, you know, the least amount of uh, ET is going to occur up in uh, the northeast part of the state and go across, to, it gets to be the maximum down there in that southwest corner. And, I, and I'll caution you on ET data. Um, we kind of just throw it around sometimes and you always should be asking whoever's throwing the data around, what time period are you considering? Because some people only talk growing season, so they might even be only looking middle of June to, to black leaf in the middle of September. This is May 1 through September. Other people talk about annual numbers. So make sure you know what they're talking about and you know, what number you're looking at because probably on an annual basis out in the southwest we're probably looking at 30 inches on an annual basis of ET. You got to nail people down to what they mean there. Okay, how much water do we need to apply? That, that depends on our e evapotranspiration rate, how effective the precipitation is, a question Marsha asked a little bit ago, 
how much water we have stored, and then how efficiently we can apply that water. So we looked at some weekly differences of ET and precipitation on this system. And so this is a water balance over at Madrid, which uh, just, just west of Curtis, about 15, 20 miles. And what you see here is up until about the 24th week, about the last, the third week in June, uh, the rainfall is the blue bar and ET is the red bar. So what are we doing with soil water up until the third week in June? We're, we're building with soil water, aren't we, with the rainfall, okay? So up until that time, ET is better, or is less in precip, and so we're building. Now then, kind of the light switch flips, and by the time we start into July, now then we have significantly more ET, then we're going to have precipitation, and of course, over time, we're going to see how much water we mine out of that soil before we need to start to irrigate. So we have a recharge, the profile period, uh, in that system. We, we use our little crop sim program and actually this is something we did for the state when they implemented 962 and we, we've calculated some gross irrigation requirements across the state. I was glad to see Gary, if I got your slide right, you said you needed about 15 inches for fully irrigated corn in the panhandle. Uh, I guess we got close here anyway so and there was no collusion I, I guarantee you on that. So uh, you know so we feel like this map is fairly reliable of kind of an average uh, irrigation amount if you're about 85 percent efficient with a with a pivot. Let's look now at the weekly variability of ET at, in Curtis and we know that we get some hot years, dry years, this year would be one of those, 2002 was one. Uh, we also get some years like last year or 1993 where it was cloudy and cool all year and so we see some variation not only in precipitation but also in, in evapotranspiration and so what you can see here is what I have is uh, throughout the season this is the weekly ET in inches. And so this top line is a line where 95% of the time the ET is going to be less than that amount. The green line is 90% of the time the ET is going to be less than that amount. That, that dark, heavy black line is the average ET that you might expect. So at Curtis, we'd be looking at about 2.1 inches of, of um, ET uh, would be our average ET that we might expect. That would be what? Three tenths of an inch a day? If I multiply three tenths of an inch times 18.86, that tells me how many gallons per minute per acre I have to have. That's the rate that the crop would be using the water. Uh, I'm not going to design many things to meet the average because that means I'm going to be short half the time. So if you wanted to be more safe and you went up and wanted to look at, say, a 90% probability, now we're looking at about two and a half inches a week. And so now we're up into a, a daily water use of what, about a third of an inch or 34 hundredths of an inch a day. You can see the variability here. The variability in ET is not nearly as large as the variability in rainfall. And so, you know, if you're probably a little bit safe, you're, you're not too bad off just maybe doing a 10% increase over average uh, during the growing season to get that 90% uh, probable number. Rainfall, it's much more variable in these. And this is then looking at the variability of precipitation in Curtis. Again, looking at the 95% of the time precipitation during that week is going to be less than this top blue curve. And so you see the variation now goes from about 2.3 down to, to about 8 tenths of an inch. So there's a wide variation in the probability of rainfall. A lot less variability in ET for well-watered uh, crop. If I put those together, uh, I'm just going to do the average for right now. So if I look at my average ET, uh, that's the green line, and I look, at my, I look at the average precipitation on the blue line, and I take the difference between those. Over this time period, I'm building soil moisture. After this period, my ET exceeds precip, and I start to have some net irrigation requirement. So this would say that you know, maybe you start to reach that point where you start to, you know, you're mining some soil water starting somewhere around the middle of May, the, well, or June, I'm sorry, around the middle of June. You know, if I had a good deep silt loam soil, I could probably lose, I uh, use uh, maybe two to three inches out of that profile before I need to irrigate. So, you know, I may not need to be irrigating until, um, until I get back into here somewhere. Uh, which is, you know, be a normal starting irrigation date, first part of July or something like that. So we can go in then and we can look at this red line and kind of look at a weekly irrigation requirement. And now then we can also then not just look at the mean, but we can look at these probabilities. And so if I'm going to design my center pivot uh, out there, I'm going to want to design for a higher probability. So I'm probably looking at that 90% line. Uh, that's, a, that's a number we use a lot in that design. So what I have on the left-hand axis here is about, we'd be looking at what, about averaging about 2.4 inches a week. If you, you can also express that as gallons per minute per, um, that you'd need for a 130-acre pivot. 
So if I look at this, you know, I'm going to need around almost, well, 800 gallon a minute maybe, somewhere in that area, uh, to meet that ET during that, that time period. Now that's only, that's not counting on using any soil water. Uh, this is kind of just to meet that, the difference between ET and, and precip. So points about capacity, analysis based on, you know, trying to use maybe 50% depletion before I irrigate. We assume each week is independent. We're not going to uh, link these probabilities. Uh, we can minimize the impact of low capacity wells if we start early in the year, and I think I'll talk about that in a minute. And uh, so we can use these above results to see when you should maybe begin to irrigate and when you start to fall behind. At 800 gallon a minute, uh, I'm not going to be able to fully meet that 90%, but if I have this good silt loam soil like outside the door here, I have a lot of soil water that I could, I could extract during that, that time period. Uh, we have a recommendation on system capacity that we've done. It's available on NebGuide um, if you go to the internet. Uh, this kind of shows... Um, Actually, right here at Gothenburg it would be the division between East Central and Southwest, so you would be about here halfway in between. Uh, this would be showing that we would need a net capacity of somewhere a little bit above four gallons per minute per acre. And then we need to increase that if we're going to be in load management or if we have some routine maintenance we have to shut down for. And then we also have to increase it for application efficiency. Uh, well, this it does include 85% application efficiency, I guess. Uh, and this is the NEB guide that's out there if you want to look at what your capacities might should be. Shift to, to Bank of an Imperial area. Uh, you know, what we see here is, is planning and emergence. Um, the ET rate, we, we see the, uh, the rainfall rate out there. Bank is my hometown. The, the saying out there is, you know, when it rained uh, 40 days and 40 nights in the Bible, Bank got a quarter of an inch, you know, and... and uh, this year, they didn't get that much, I don't think. We also know from crop physiology, and this is some of what Gary was discussing earlier, is that crops are most susceptible to stress somewhere around this, this tassel and, and uh, silking time. And so, you know, what do you see here? You see those peak ET rates. Those ET rates are kind of reaching their maximum about the same time that we're meeting that, that high uh, susceptibility to crop yield. And so, you know, if you got a low capacity well, you're going to want to be some, you know, want to build up some storage soil moisture going into that period so that you can carry yourself through that. Obviously, you want to irrigate a little earlier. Uh, we know there are a lot of systems out there where the system capacity may change during the year. I'm sure none of our center pivot manufacturer friends here have ever seen an in gun work quite that well. I, I don't know, the pressure must be 4 psi in that thing. So, this is a system where they don't have near enough uh, uh, water in this system. Uh, so we need to look at, you know, what we could do to deal with that changing capacity. So when we start to look at managing these limited capacities, and we're back looking at ET rates, the probability we're going to look at effective precipitation like we've done. When I look at a gross capacity of 800 gallon a minute, if I reduce that because of application efficiency, and I think I'm using 85% here, you know, this, the blue line is what we have to pump. The green line is what we make available to the plants to use. Now, 85% is pretty conservative. We certainly had, could, do, could look at 90% here and, and do a, uh, a pretty good job. So the black line is the mean ET minus effective precipitation. So you see at 85%, we can stay above the mean. We probably can't stay above the 90%. So what I've shown here on this slide is the green slide here now is showing the probable ET minus effective precipitation you'd have to have to meet crop water requirements 90% of the time, or 95% of the time. So this is a pretty safe design. And so what we see in this case, uh, at this location, we start, to, we start to get into what we call a stress period, where we're mining soil water sometime around the, the 1st of July, and that stress period is going to go really through, through all of July and the first part of August. What's going to determine, I mean, th during this time, we're doing what? We're extracting water out of the soil, aren't we? to meet crop water requirements if we're going to keep up. So what's going to determine whether or not this design would be acceptable? It's going to depend on what kind of, what kind of soil I have. If I have a good deep silt blown soil, it'll store a lot of water and I'd probably be okay. If you're on the Valentine Sands, you're probably going to you need a little bit more capacity. Um, so the way we look at that is how do we develop a depletion in the soil? Once we start to mine soil water here, how does that depletion build over time? So in this case, this is showing, gosh, we only depleted an inch of water during that time period. So it probably is even okay on my sand. So, so maybe this is a little higher capacity than I would need. What would happen here, what would happen though if I went into this period and I had a three inch depletion before that critical period? Well, now then, uh, if I went in there with three inch depletion, I'm gonna come out of there with four inch depletion. Is that okay on the silt loam? Yeah, probably okay. Is it okay on the sand? No, not at all, okay. 
So, um, you know, the interaction between soil type and this capacity is, is something that we look at um, as we go through here. So, you know, if I have a limited capacity, I'm not going to want to be at that bottom three inch depletion going into the, the first part of July on, on a sandy soil. I'm going to want to build up some, some reserve. Even if I'm on a good siloam soil, I'm going to want to build up a little reserve going into that first part of July. Now, we don't want you to irrigate and waste water in June, but we don't want to go into July being drier than, than what we can stand uh, if we have a dry, a dry period. Another way you might look at that, this is looking at um, kind of a month, a 10-day running water balance. So this is down at Clay Center, Nebraska. I think this is, an, I think this is 1983. So the, the little light blue colored lines are rainfall, the, the green lines are ET, and then these little, um, I don't know whatever color that beige color is, is uh, looking at the uh, difference between precip and ET during that week. And so early in the growing season in May, in this particular year, I think this was 1983, during this time we were gaining uh, some soil water. Uh, it was a pretty dry spring that year, so we started to mine soil water. If I had a net capacity of 500 gallon a minute, you know, I could, I could pump enough water to keep up with these uh, depletions here. But once I got into July, now then I could about keep up for these two, uh, but I can't, uh, I can't keep up here. So again, I'm going to mine some soil water. So that's going to be the period when we have a deficit. Uh, we've got to go back and add up that deficit and see whether or not it's going to be big enough that we can live with it. Uh, in this case, if I had a sandy loam soil and I could hold an inch and a half per foot and I had a four foot root zone, I can only, I can only look at about, um, what, uh, three inches of depletion until, until I got into plant water stress. Uh, very likely I'm going to go past that. So 500 gallon a minute is not going to be a net, enough net capacity on, a, on that sandy loam soil. So kind of the take home on the system capacity is we want you to get ahead of the game a little bit. I think this year may be as important as it was in 2003 uh, to go out and look at your soil moisture conditions in the field early in the growing season next spring. In 2003, what we saw a lot of places is that the uh, 2002, as you know, was extremely dry, about like this year. And uh, people did not, in some places, people did not have the subsoil moisture that they were accustomed to going into the growing season. And it really affected them in the early part of the growing season. So, you know, we're strongly recommended you get out there and do some sampling. Uh, on the other hand, I don't think we can blatantly assume that we're drier than we normally are either. Uh, I had a meeting in Kearney, oh, I don't know, maybe in the first week in November. I drove by a couple of uh, soybean fields and every leaf in that soybean field was was yellow and falling off the plant and um, the pivot was running. That person is not going to be in a situation where they're drier this year than they normally are. I think there may be some people out there that are over irrigated this year and they're actually carrying a little higher soil moisture into that system. But if you're in an area where you have some flexibility on allocation, we really encourage you to get out there early next spring and, and you know, either you or your crop consultant, uh, you know, let's see where we're at in subsoil moisture. If you can if you're using moisture monitoring, we'd really like to see you get that in early rather than late. We're not going to encourage you to pre-irrigate uh, like they are down in some areas in northwest Kansas, but we would encourage you to start thinking about trying to build up some soil moisture maybe in June, a little bit earlier than you normally do if you find out that you've got a dry subsoil out there. Uh, give yourself some insurance. Don't over-irrigate, but, but give yourself a little insurance and to, to carry you through that, that time period. With that, Chuck, I think that's... I'd open it up, I guess, to any questions or any comments you might have. Uh, Marsha's question is, is that in the data we looked at, about 60 years of data from 49 to, to 2004, did we see a, a change in, in the um, precipitation amount? We, I don't, we don't have a long enough record there. Uh, I don't think Marsha to pick that up. Um, so no, we didn't see that particular kind of shift. Some other people have argued that since we've been irrigating now for what, um, 60, 70 years, that we maybe have humidified the environment a little bit and that there is a, an increase in evaporation, uh, I'm sorry, of precipitation out there. There's some people um, point to that, but, you know, it's probably like any question. It depends how you pose it, whether or not the statistician is going to deny your conclusion. I think it's really hard to show statistically. One problem we have is we have not had consistent measurement methods or the consistent people making measurements. So, you know, you might go for two decades, one person's done it, all of a sudden somebody does something different, and, you know, we see data bounce real quick at certain times. So I don't know if our quality data is good enough to do, to do that, the, the data we use at least. 
I would uh, just lift up one other thing, and, and we did uh, some center pivot um, management um, day-long workshops a year ago. Uh, we did one here. We did one in York. We're going to do three this next year. Uh, one's going to be in Norfolk, one's in Broken Bow, and one is in Bridgeport. Uh, the one in Broken Bow is, I think, uh, February the 15th, and then we do two during the, the week of the 11th out there in February. Um, it might be the week before that, the 6th, I think. I, yeah, the 15th. The, day, the 15th is the day, I think. I think of the week before that, on the Monday and the Wednesday but there. So uh, we'll be getting some notice out, and guys like Chuck will make us look good by getting notices out. But if you're interested, um, you know, we'll do another um, Pivot Schools around the, around the state.